Good morning, everyone. Um, they'll let me back after last week. My name's George Donaldson. I was the minister in Calder Cooks um, a long time ago now. Um, and I helped out for here for a wee while a couple of years ago. And they've been nice enough to ask me back while um, you know, to, su to supply the pulpit the last couple of Sundays. So we are here today to worship God and to give thanks for all his goodness. I think we have some intimations. No? Okay, then in that case, let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come near to you today. We come into your presence, seeking your love, seeking your grace, seeking your direction for our lives in this time of confusion and trouble. Loving Father, guide us and direct us in all things. Lead us day by day close to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may follow him and obey him, that we may love him and serve him. And Father, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worship you and the Lord Jesus whom you have sent. Bless us now and keep us in your hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Right. Our opening hymn is a good one. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made.
before we pray, I'm just going to say a couple of things here. First of all, it's a rather long reading today, and um, I was a wee bit merciful. I, um, I could have done the whole chapter, but that was a very long chapter. So I'm going to tell you what happens before we start the reading. Then Linda will take it on and read. Basically, the situation is Jesus has friends in Bethany, two sisters, Martha and Mary. I'm sure you've heard of them. They have a brother called Lazarus, and Lazarus falls ill. Martha and Mary send word to Jesus. Lazarus is ill. He's, you, know, you know him. You love him. He's your friend. They don't say any more than that. They don't say, come quickly or anything like that. They just tell Jesus, Lazarus is ill, and they expect him to come. But Jesus doesn't come. And Jesus doesn't say a word. No message. And Jesus doesn't even do what he could very easily have done, which is give the word and Lazarus would be well. Lazarus dies. The disciples don't understand why Jesus didn't go, and Martha and Mary surely don't understand why Jesus didn't come to them to help them in their trouble. And that basically is where we are. Jesus has finally decided to go to Bethany, and the disciples are going with him. They're puzzled, but they're not half as puzzled as the two sisters are. And that is where the reading will start, or start off from, when Linda reads to us in a short time. But before that, let's pray. Almighty Father, you have created all things. You've created us in your image, male and female. You have created us for fellowship with you. Loving Father, forgive us that we are so slow to reach out to you, that we are so unwilling to allow you into our lives. Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in what we have done. Father, we are sorry truly sorry. We ask your forgiveness. We ask you, Father, not to cast us off, but to grant us a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you, that we may serve you in word and deed and thought. Loving Father, use us to build your church, to reach out to those around us, to be the helping hand to those who are in trouble, to be the kindly voice to those who can see no hope, to be there for those around us as Jesus is there for us. Father, we thank you for him for his love, his grace, his sacrifice of himself for us. And we offer you further prayers in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, Linda will read to us from John. John chapter 11, verse 7 to 27. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Teacher, the disciples answered, just a short time ago, the people there wanted to stone you, and are you planning to go back? Jesus said, 
A day has 12 hours, doesn't it? So those who walk in broad daylight do not stumble, for they see the light of this world. But if they walk during the night, they stumble, because they have no light. Jesus said this and then added, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, If he is asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, but for your sake I am glad that I was not with him, so that you will believe. Let us go to him. Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us all go along with the teacher, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been buried four days before. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Judeans had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask him for. Your brother will rise to life, Jesus told her. I know, she replied, that he will rise to life on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live, even though they die. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered, I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Amen, and thanks be to God. Thank you. Our hymn, our song now is, This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Number 194. <laughs> as well there's no another three verses I'd be lost I, I, I could have just about got there 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 then behave yourself Harry okay the first service the first funeral service I took in my first parish out in the islands in Tyree and call well it was in Tyree wasn't it, in both islands at the same time um, but the first funeral service I took at the end of it, a man who became a very, very good friend came up to me and said, Mr. Donaldson, he says, why did you not read the whole verse? And I said, what verse? He said, verse 25. 
You didn't read the whole verse. You missed out the important bit. And I couldn't fathom quite what he was talking about, but we, I looked and I realized he was right. Verse 25 of John chapter 11 is probably, no, it is the greatest assurance that Jesus ever gave to his disciples and friends. And he gives it to us today too. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I had missed out the last four words because I had been reading from the Book of Common Order, not from the Bible. Lachie, who was a Baptist elder, was looking at me very quizzically, and I thought, I, Baptist elder, he's got the Church of Scotland minister, you know. But actually, it wasn't that. He was very serious. He said, at a funeral, we need to challenge. When there's trouble comes, we need to challenge. Jesus did that. So he said, going to no do that again. And I did not say how no, because I knew how no. <laughs> he said, uh, going to no do that again. I said, no, Lachie, I won't do that again. And I never have. Every time I read that verse at a funeral service, I always complete the verse. The four most important words, do you believe this? Martha was, I think, angry. I've read various accounts, various commentaries in this chapter, and generally speaking, they don't say this, but I think she was angry. I, I just have this feeling that the way she says it, if you had been here, she said, my brother wouldn't have died. I think there's another verse, there's another unspoken sentence there. Where were you? And then she says, and I think she's really in a sense grasping at straws here, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. The background, the backing to those words something like maybe a week of waiting, watching her brother slowly sinking into death and wondering where Jesus was. Jesus who was so ready to help. Jesus who would go as soon as somebody asked. Remember the story of Jairus and his daughter? The wee girl, she's ill at home and her dad goes to Jesus and he says, my daughter's ill, can you please come? And Jesus drops everything and he goes. Or the centurion whose servant is ill and he comes, he sends another, he, he comes to Jesus himself. He, he, says, he, says, he says, Jesus, if you, if you give the word, my servant will, be retire, will, will, be, be, will recover. And Jesus says, right, okay, well, let's, let's go. And he says, why do you want to go? All you have to do is say the word. I know who you are. You have authority. A Roman centurion who knew that Jesus was sent from God and had the power of God to speak and rule over life and death. He had done it for so many and he didn't do it for Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Why not? Well, what Jesus does here is he gives her a sideways answer. Your brother, she, he says, will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And again, unspoken. 
But that's not enough. I want him now. I want him now. Four days ago he died. Four days since he died. Three days since the funeral. And she's raw. And she's angry. And she doesn't understand. You know, I don't think that anyone has sat at the deathbed of someone they loved. And when the time came, not echoed everything that's in Martha's heart here. Why? Why? Why have the prayers for a recovery been unanswered? Why could we not be given at least another, another few days, another month, maybe another six months, just to sort things out and do, do some of the things we, never, we were never able to do? Why now, God? Why now? Why couldn't, why couldn't you just have given us a wee bit more? This is grief. Grief for a brother. But it could be for a father, a mother. It could be for a child, God forbid. It could be for a husband or a wife. Martha doesn't understand. She's still actively grieving for Lazarus. She's raw. You know what it's like? I remember when I was at school, I used to be an awful, I was an awful one for falling over and skinning my knees. And the trouble with skinned knees is that the, the dirt, the grit, you know, the, the dirt gets in. So it's got to be, the knees got to be washed before you put the bandage on. And you know how sensitive it is. My mum trying to, just trying to wash it away and I'm yelling and squirming. And she's, and she's saying, well, you sit still. It's like that. Grief is like that. It's as if we've lost the top layer of our skin, our emotional skin, and we're, we're hurting. It doesn't matter what anybody says, we're hurting. And that's where she is. And then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha, bless her, says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I know who you are. I believe you are exactly who you've, you've, you, you've, you, you've said you are. But I still want my brother back. So what happens next is that she went back to the house and she called Mary, her sister, called her aside from the guest. She didn't want everybody to know. She says, the master's here, the teacher's here. He's asking for you. Mary heard this. She went up quickly. She got up quickly and went out. And the very first thing she says to Jesus when she finds him is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she's weeping. And some of the folks who are in the house to comfort them, to show, pay their respects, they've come, they've followed her, and they see this. And they're deeply moved. Jesus is deeply moved. He says, where have you laid him? Where's the grave? And so they go to the grave. And then Jesus weeps. Now, it's an odd thing. There are a number of cases in the Bible where a word is used only once. And that is a case here. 
the word that, G, that, that John uses, it isn't the word for noisy grief, you know, weeping and wailing, beating the breast, sorry, beating the breast and, you know, and, 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 and crying and, 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 and calling out and, and, and that. It's simply, it's what happens when something gets to you and without being able to stop, the tears just flow and they run down the face and you can't stop them. You're not, as I say, it's silent, silent weeping if you like. And it's the deepest of all the signs of grief. This just, I've seen it only a number of times. It comes, you know, I've seen it in funerals when at the point when the curtains begin to close or the coffin's lowered and the next the people, the wife, the husband, the children, suddenly at that point the tears flow sometimes people just break but often it's just the tears flow there's a thing about Scotsmen at funerals we grit our teeth and we don't show our feelings not always but too often we don't show our feelings we grit our teeth we refuse to be upset. That's wrong. If Jesus weeps for Lazarus, we weep for our loved ones. And sometimes, it doesn't matter how long, sometimes something just catches us and the tears start to flow again. And there's no shame in that that is normal because the Lord Jesus Christ is the pattern for humanity. If he weeps, we weep. And here we see another thing about this story and it's a very strange thing. As Jesus begins to weep, some of the people watching turn to one another and say, See how he loved Lazarus. They recognize the emotion for what it is. But there are others, we're told, who, <laughs> if he loved them that much, could he not have stopped them from dying? And now we realize in that but Jesus divides. There are those who when they come into his place, when they come into his company, when they read the stories, and they're not stories, they are accounts of things that happened. I have no problem with Jesus' miracles. I know who he was. He was the Son of God. He was the Messiah, the Christ. Of course he could do miracles. He was the one, the Word of God. John calls him the Word of God through whom all things that are made were made. He was there before creation. And it was through him that the whole universe came into its, into its being. But there's always folk who will turn against him. Always folk who say, ha, huh, rubbish. Who's got time for that? What comes out of this story? Well, first of all, there are times when we wonder if God is there. Sometimes we wonder if God cares. Sometimes we feel lost and alone in a world that's totally hostile. We wonder where our lives are going. And we're tempted to despair. 
And I guess there's a lot of people that have been in that place over the last year and a half, two years. It seems as if this is never ending. It seems as if there are always going to be more people ill, more people dying. The numbers keep rising. And you know, I was looking at the, looking at the internet before I left. I looked at the BBC, BBC site. And you know, on that whole page, there was one, one story stood out. A man actually talking sense, a football manager. Why, is every, why, have, why have people got an objection to being vaccinated, being inoculated? He said, I've been inoculated. I didn't do it for me. I did it, I did it just for me. I did it for the people around me. That's what you do. And another story saying that this was the great, this, was the, this is the great challenge now to get the people who have not been inoculated, to get them to accept inoculation. Because they, oddly enough, will be the ones that are at most risk. But they don't see it. And so we see these stories and we think, is it never going to end? What is God doing here? Why did he let this happen? Well, I'm sure that's what Martha and Mary were thinking. I'm sure that's what Lazarus thought before he died, as he realized he was dying. Where's Jesus? Why doesn't he come? Why doesn't he care? But he does care. We see it here in the story. This is, the, this is the, one of the great lessons we can take from this chapter. He does care. And if we've given ourselves to him, if we've committed ourselves to him, then we're his servants. He's not using Lazarus. He's not abusing his trust or Martha or Mary's trust. He's in control. He's aware of what's happening, and he has a plan. Jesus loves us. He's here in our midst, where two or three are gathered together. There I am in the midst, he says. He's here right now. You got something to say to him today? Say it. Martha and Mary made it very clear to him that they were angry, that he had let them down. At least that's how they saw it. He's big enough to take that. He's big enough to take our questions. He's loving enough to listen to our questions and answer our questions. He is a wonderful Savior. We don't understand them all the time. But then I don't understand me all the time. I don't understand a lot of the people around me. How am I going to understand the mind of God? I am the resurrection and the life, he says. Trust in me. You will never die. Do you believe this? Mary and Martha's faith was very fragile. Jesus turns to them and says, open the tomb. And, well, I don't know what, I can't, I don't know what the good news says, but what the NIV says is, Martha tells him, there is a bad odor. You know, <laughs> Sometimes in the modern life, we're, we're a bit mealy-mouthed. The King James has Martha say to Jesus, Lord, he's been dead four days. He'll be stinking. I have a couple of anecdotes along those lines, but I'm not going to tell them because we're going back. I'm, I want to have my Sunday lunch as well, and I'm sure you do as well. This is really gruesome. It's really graphic, but it's true. Four days. 
But Jesus says, no, open the, open the tomb. So somebody opens the tomb, get, rolls a stone away. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And there's a point to the real fact that he brings, he actually calls Lazarus by name. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of life and death, stands at the, at the mouth of an open grave and says, come out, without specifying who he's speaking to, it's more than likely that everybody will come out. The whole, every grave will open. There will be a general resurrection from the dead. And it's not time yet. He's that powerful. So he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out and he's in his, in his grave clothes. He can only take wee steps. He must feel a real idiot. Except that he's alive. He's back. What do you make of somebody who can do that? Somebody who can bring a man back who's been dead four days. Jesus loves us. He has the power to do all for us. But he'll do it in his time and his plan because his plan is perfect. And we are asked to trust, to believe, to follow. And I find that the more closely I follow him and the more I pay heed to him and the more I read about him, so that I know who he was, who he is. I listen to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul have to say about the man they met and knew and served. The easier life becomes, even in difficulties, even in troubles. There is a wonderful verse in the letter to the Romans. Romans 8 and 28. For we know that God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. He works for good in all things, for the good of those who love him. In everything that happens, God's hand is there. Martha and Mary didn't understand it until Jesus completed the task. Then they knew what it was about. I'm sure that many, many people became Jesus' disciples that day just because of what they saw and heard at Lazarus' tomb. I'm also sure that some of the people who watched it and then went to the Pharisees rejected him completely and utterly. And they are the ones that we should be sorry for. To turn their back on the Lord of life. I think I'm going to finish now. I've gone on a bit long. Let's sing George Matheson's great hymn, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go.
Loving Father, we pray for those who are in need. We pray for those who we know, our friends, our families, our loved ones. Father, you know them. You know them better than we do. And so we come to you, Father. You know their needs. You know what is best for them. And so we pray that you will fulfill your purposes, that you will love them and cherish them. We pray for those who are ill, that they may recover. We pray for those who are discouraged and trying to make sense of life. And we pray, Father, that you will speak to them and give them a sense of your purpose. We pray, Father, for those who are, are struggling financially or materially. And we pray, Father, that you will supply all their needs. We pray, Father, for our nation struggling through this continuing crisis. Loving Father, we pray, guide us and direct us and grant that we may see the end of this soon. Father, we pray for your church. Give us the love and the grace. Give us the resources. Give us the power to, to reach out to those around us, those who are in need. Father, whatever the need may be, give us hearts to supply that need, to help where help is needed, to speak where words can make a difference for the better, to reach out with a helping hand. Loving Father, we pray for those who are abroad working in your working in your cause missionaries practical workers aid workers father we think of them and we thank you for them and for their courage and for their their love and we pray that you'll take care of them and look after them very much and we pray father for all the world that men and women and children may have their eyes opened and their hearts turned, that they may see your love, your grace, that they may seek your peace, that they may learn, that we may learn to love one another as Christ has loved us, not to turn on one another, but to, to seek the best for one another. We pray, Father, for one another here in this congregation today. Loving Father, we've all come to you, each with our own needs, each with our own longings. Father, we pray for one another, that your love, that your grace will touch each one of us and draw us ever closer to the Lord Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. It's in his name, Father, we offer these prayers. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high peace priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. <laughs>
peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the blessing and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you all now and forever. Amen.